so Morris, let's talk about the National Theatre School just briefly because you were, it was formed in 1961 in Montreal as a bilingual school and you joined it in 1966. Right. So it was five years old at that point. Right. What was it like? What was the dynamic? Of, uh, well, we're then occupying the, t the Salada T building at the bottom of St. Lawrence Boulevard, the top three floors of a very old building, with an old lift going up and down slowly. And uh, those conditions were uh, not the best, you would think, but somehow it forced us into a, into a type of heat, a type of passion that, that I, strangely enough, I think was somewhat diluted when they moved into their marvelous new premises. Because uh, then you see, when you go into those premises, the, art the administrative people take over because they're running this building now and they're telling you which rooms you can go into and when you can go into this room. And, and they start running timetables and, and the artistic side begins to diminish accordingly. When you, your facilities are just a, a mix of spaces, they, they, they can't. You, you run the place. It's your passion. It's one-on-one. -on -one. It's intensely human and, and uh, there's nothing between you, a student, teacher and so on. So the passions were full. Were full and, it was very, very exciting. Powers Thomas was there? Powers Thomas was there. And... Uh, Bill it, Davis was running it? Bill Davis was running the English section because the chap from Bristol left suddenly and went to Seattle. And the French and English? How was the French and English? Well, it was, a, it was very political. The French side was very political. And funny enough, the guys running the French section were mostly from Europe. <laughs> so they got a bit of they got a bit of a rough time. They were being challenged from time to time by the French students, who said, "You are not speaking our language. You are speaking classical French to us. You know, you don't understand our passions, our needs." And that would come to the fore from time to time. <laughs> it was quite entertaining as a sideshow. Now you are uh, now you you are working on. With Mopo, you're working with uh, young South African artists, yes. trying to bring them to Canada to learn. You're trying to tour yeah. uh, South African productions to Canada. Why? What is it about South Africans coming to Canada as opposed to going to Argentina, Brazil, well, uh, or the, the play that I'm bringing to Canada next year, I hope, I think, has toured the world. Because we don't have infrastructure in South Africa, we don't have a touring circuit in South Africa, the only lifeline that uh, South Africans might be offered is an overseas company, an overseas interest. And uh, so they go to, we put our plays on at festivals and we invite these overseas directors to come and see us and hopefully they'll invite us to come to London or to Canada or to Australia. It's a lifeline for us which we need desperately in South Africa until we can rebuild our own theatre companies and, and uh, provide the sustenance in South Africa over the long haul instead of this ad hoc business of doing theatre right now. Is there any other country in Africa that has a strong theatre as South Africa? Or am I defining it in European terms? I don't really know. I can't say. I don't think so. As far as I know from uh, the artists, I bet from across the continent. You know, the Ghanaian theatre, the Nigerian theatre has a great tradition. The playwrights that they have and so on. But I don't know the full answer to that. I would guess that they're not as developed even as South Africa is at the moment. I would guess that. I wish we had more links continent-wise. And, you know, uh, we talk of the African Renaissance. We don't really know what that means yet, because there's a lot of mm, resistance even to other Africans coming to South Africa. There's a lot of uh, antagonism. They think they're taking jobs from us, etc. That, you know, is happening in South Africa. So the generosity of an African Renaissance is a long way to go yet before we achieve it. But it would be, it would be great if we could create those links and share across Africa. 
I know what my attachment to South Africa is because I think South Africa, because you're a white South African, right? Africa is full of uh, black people and people who've moved there from uh, East Asia and at the north there's the Arabic people. Okay? Right. You're a white South African. So in a way, you are living in a more intense way the multicultural adventure or absolute direction that this country is going. Yeah. In a far more diluted and less intense way but is going there in a very interesting, and I, I wave all my flags for what, what's happening up here, but what South Africa is doing in a far more condensed and intense way, and you are an epitome of it, because you're in South Africa, and from Lithuania. That's why I keep going back to that circle. Uh, you epitomize in a I was wondering why you keep going back. what we're trying, what's happening here. I'm sorry, it just occurred to me. Mm, mm, mm. I remember when Mandela was elected, we had a big celebration at the Centaur. Many artists came and performed and so on. And I was suddenly said, you have to speak. And he said to me, I don't know what to say. I went up there. I thought I have to give a tribute of some sort. But I looked at my hand, which was sort of shaking there. And I said, you see, this hand is white. It's inescapably white. And, and, and no matter how heartfelt you feel about apartheid and suffer for your comrades, this hand is white and you benefit from the color if you are in South Africa. The fact that this hand is white, you benefit from it. Your education, your standard of living, this, your that. Here is Mandela, comes out of prison after 27 years and said, it does not matter that your hand is, your hand is white. You can be a South African. And that was an inescapable invitation to go back and, and, uh, and work there and live there.